we use the term gospel all the time. Now, some of that's intentional. I mean, several years ago, we, we made an intentional effort to talk about the gospel so much more and be, be clear about what we mean when we say the gospel. But it can become sort of a byword in churches like ours, used so often that it becomes almost passe, and we lose a sense of what we're really talking about here. But when we talk about the gospel, we know this. We know that the meaning of that word is good news. It's a declaration of something that's emphatically true, that has the power to change the lives of anyone who trusts in it and believe in it. It's a comprehensive message. In fact, I would say that some of us in this room have been undersold when it comes to the gospel because the gospel is a, is a lot more than just saying Jesus died for me. It's not less than that, but it's certainly more than that. Because sometimes I think, maybe just subconsciously, but in this equation we work in our mind about the effects of the gospel in us, we think it basically goes like this. We live in a messed up world we can agree. But if we place our faith and trust in Jesus, then, then one day, somewhere in the future, whenever that is, whenever I die or Maybe by the grace of God, he, he returns before that happens. Then I get to be with him in heaven. He died for me, so I get to go to heaven one day. But it ignores so much more of the power and promise of the gospel. That this messed up world that we live in, there's an antidote to that. And the antidote is not simply dying and going to heaven one day. It's the reign and rule of Jesus Christ in this world. In your life, in the church capital C, wherever believers are, and ultimately in all the nations. It's the rule and reign of Christ. That's the hope. When Jesus came into the world proclaiming the gospel, he didn't simply say, now a lot of stuff is going to happen to me. Ignore all of that. Because the only part that matters is I'm going to die, and that's so you can go to heaven one day. In fact, he came in saying something much different. And what does this have to do with you? Well, I'm going to talk about some theology today. We've sung theology today. But I don't want you to be afraid of the world that you live in. And I don't want you to be fearful about the future. And, and I don't want you to underestimate the sovereignty of God in your affairs and the affairs of the world that we live in. I want you to trust in what Jesus said. And so today we're going to open the door a little bit. We'll, we'll crack the door a little bit into what is the pervasive theme of the Gospel of Matthew. So we're just going to begin to peer on what's, the, in, on to what's the other side of this and the kingdom of God. So pray with me this morning as we prepare to look at our text. Father God, I pray that you would be well honored and well pleased with how we handle your word today. And what I say about it and from it, and what we hear and do with it, Lord, how it affects what we think and feel how we behave as we leave this place. Father, teach us something beautiful about yourself. This is something glorious about your promises to us. And Father, I pray as you do, you give us hope. Give us encouragement. Lord, send us out stirred up, built up, ready. And Father, if there's someone here in this room who's not part of that kingdom that we declare today, if they're not recipients of that promise, if they don't have a grip on that hope, I pray that today they would. I pray that their lives would be changed today and for forever. And Father, Father give hope to, to those in this room who are just going through a rough time, um, whose faith is, is at a bit of an ebb right now. Um, things are hard. Life is hard. Things feel and look bleak sometimes. Father, give us confidence in something beyond ourselves. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort and empower and strengthen and motivate, teach and lead today. Convict and instruct. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 12, is our text today. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, in the, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. 
from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's do a little bit of necessary background work, and, and you can rest easy, though I have a lot of information for you. I did promise one of our fine senior adults who's volunteering in preschool today in the children's church time that I would keep it brief for her sake. So you get to be beneficiaries of that. Brief is a relative term, however, and has different meanings to different ones of us. So brief to me may not be brief to her or to you. But let's answer this question first. Why Galilee? I mean, you may be curious about that when you read the story of Jesus. I mean, why didn't he go to Jerusalem? Jerusalem is where all the action is. Jerusalem is where the temple is. Jerusalem is where the largest concentration of people exists. Jerusalem is where the religious leaders are. This is where the Pharisees and the Sadducees carry about their primary work. I mean, this is the focal point. This is the centerpiece of everything. Why, why Galilee? Well, there are at least three reasons here. and I, I want to sort of build them, I think, in importance. The first one is the prosecution of John. You could say persecution, for he was certainly persecuted, but I use prosecution intentionally because he was arrested. Now, the trial was a sham, and his imprisonment was, for all we know, it's, non, it's not biblical in its history, but there's some other writing that suggests he was put in a prison that was underground, grim and dark, and probably for about two years he was imprisoned by Herod Antipas. You may remember a little bit of John's story. Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great. He had now taken rule and reign over that section of what was his father's kingdom. He had been married to someone named Phasaelus. But when he traveled to Rome, he fell in love with his brother Philip's wife. And he took his brother's wife before his brother was dead. Now, in pretty much any culture, any place, that's a no-go. But for a Jewish king, it's clearly in violation of the laws of God. Now, John the Baptist was the most prominent preacher, teacher, prophet of his day, and he spoke out against this boldly, bravely. He spoke to the power that existed, and he said this is a violation of the very laws of God and condemned it, even used it as a teaching example to all the people. Well, this didn't sit well with Herod Antipas' new wife, and in her jealousy and rage, she sought out his arrest. Later, she would seek his death. This would effectively end the ministry of John the Baptist. In fact, we'll read some more and hear some more of his struggle down the road. It's his faith began to wane a bit here and there and the difficulties of the imprisonment. There's a transition here. But it, I would say this to you. If you're thinking of the, the language here and it says, after this, Jesus withdrew. This is less about Jesus and any sort of fearful withdrawal because of persecution. Persecution of Jesus had not yet begun in any significant way. This is less about that than really just about the changing of the timeline of God's redemptive plan. The baton has been passed. When John the Baptist came giving those prophetic messages about the one who is coming, the one whose laces I'm not fit to untie, he wasn't thinking of something just vague, nonspecific, somewhere in the future. He was talking about Jesus. And Jesus is here. And he's begun his ministry. And now the focal point is no longer on John, who by his own testimony had to become less so that Jesus would become greater. And so think about just this shift now. The shift in focus is over Jesus. But it's not just what happened to John. It's also the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. There'll be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he's made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Galilee was not highly esteemed. In fact, historically, Galilee was despised. It was looked down upon. It was as if it was existing under an Old Testament sort of curse that darkness was their domain in Galilee. And at the very least, there was no light of that great religious center, as I mentioned a moment ago, where the temple is where the religious leaders existed, where the Sanhedrin was, all these things. I mean, the focal point, if there's a place where, where God's presence would have been perceived, it would have been at the temple, but not, not, not Galilee. But there are hints in this of what God is doing here, light dawning here, the beginning of the revelation of Christ, light dawns here. Where do we first hear Jesus preaching? Where do we first see the content of Jesus' message? Where do we first see Jesus' miracles begin to take place? It's in the Galilee. God, in his sovereign goodness, decides to shine his light in Galilee first. Galilee of the nations. Now, for those of you who are looking for some clues here and connecting some dots in Matthew's gospel, 
What does the end of Matthew's gospel command all of his followers to do? To make him known to the nations. To the nations. It's a message, it's a testimony of Jesus coming, not just for those religious Jewish people, but for all the nations, wherever there's darkness, to usher in light. So it's not simply, I don't want you to think simply that this is Jesus moving to Galilee because there's an Old Testament text that says he must, so he's checking off this box necessarily. The prophecy is only there because it's part of God's divine plan to bring good news, to bring salvation, to bring redemption everywhere, to everyone. He's coming not just to the Jews, he's coming to the nations. And that brings me to the purpose of the Messiah. Light shines best in dark places. In this dark place, a kingdom marked by darkness is being invaded by the kingdom of light and the king who has come. And we begin to see more evidence of this great battle. And Jesus the king, by virtue of his victory over the enemy, is the purpose of the Messiah to come and establish a new kingdom. And he begins doing it right there in Galilee. Now, this may not be what you typically think of Jesus. When you think of what Jesus did, what Jesus was about, if I were to ask you to describe the the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, maybe in a paragraph, this may not be prominent. In fact, some people may not even include it. But the most significant aspect of Jesus' earthly ministry was probably not the miracle-working power. What he did with the most frequency, what he was mostly about, if you would ask the people to define Jesus, they would define Jesus as a preacher or a teacher that's why his own followers called him rabbi i mean jesus was preaching preaching for all of this earthly ministry this is what he primarily did and we can just imagine how busy he would have been an itinerant preacher teacher josephus first century historian tells us there were more than 200 cities and villages in galilee each with more than fifteen thousand people Even if he was high in his estimation, if Jesus had stopped at two communities a day, that would require more than three months never taking a break of preaching. I mean, this is what Jesus did. And he went from place to place and city to city and village to village, proclaiming the good news, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed and possessed, and declaring this announcement, the kingdom of God of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. Don't be thrown by the terminology. As you're going to read through Matthew's gospel, you're going to see kingdom of God. You're going to see kingdom of heaven. These are interchangeable terms. In fact, Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus uses this terminology more than in any other gospel, over 50 times in the gospel of Matthew, more than any other place or or combined in all the rest of the New Testament. This is the focus. And what he's saying is something significant is happening breaking into this world right here, right now, and all this darkness that you see, something significant is happening, breaking through. It's here because I'm here. The kingdom is here because the king has come. And so what's the right response? If God's kingdom is appearing and breaking through in this world right now, and what you see is not definitive, and the king that you follow is only destructive, then what should you do? If the way that you're living only leads to death and keeps you in darkness, then what should you do? You should repent. You should repent. You should turn from that kingdom and that darkness and that destruction, and you should turn to light and to life. That's why you can't separate this declaration and this response. God's kingdom is here. You need a new king. God's kingdom is here. You need to break free from the darkness that you're in. The dominion that you're under. God's kingdom is here. How will you do that? Repent. Turn. Turn and follow the king. Remember, we talked a bit about repentance. It's not simply feeling sorry for your sin. It's not merely intellectual change of mind. It's a radical change of direction. It's transforming of an entire person who turns around. It involves your will, your thought, your emotion, your action. And it shows up with evidence, fruit, that keeps with repentance, according to Matthew 3, 8. So, Jesus comes preaching. Jesus the preacher comes, preaching this message of repentance for the kingdom's sake. 
And again, we saw this already because this is what John preached. Remember in chapter 3, verse 2, John said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, he was talking about something specific and something present. Jesus, right here, right now. When Jesus preached, he says the same. Repent, for the kingdom is, of heaven is at hand. Throughout the Gospels, over 70 passages, 100 references to the kingdom Jesus made. And when Jesus sent the disciples out, when they were finally ready to go out in pairs, when they were finally ready to begin their apostolic ministry preaching the gospel, what did they preach? Matthew 10, 7. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, 6. And here's what they preached. Verse 7. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, again, I'm only cracking the door today to the kingdom of heaven because it's going to permeate things we're going to hear over the next several weeks. But this is the heart of the gospel, the kingdom of heaven. So what is it? Well, historically and theologically speaking, most simply, it means that the God of Israel is going to rule the whole world. It, it means that no one else will prevail, not the gods of ancient Egypt, not the gods of Rome, not any temporal king like Herod or Pharaoh or Caesar, but that God himself will rule. God's laws will be fulfilled. God's will will be done. Jesus will reign. Jesus is Messiah. So when we think of the kingdom of heaven, I want you to think about it again as we begin to set a framework for this movement forward. Think of the kingdom of heaven in two respects. One is the reign of of God in Christ. God's reign. The kingdom of God is his kingship, his, his rule, his, his authority. And when you begin to see that, you can see that all through the New Testament, passage after passage, when the kingdom is spoken of not as a, a place, not as a particular kingdom with walls or gates or a castle, but the rule and reign of God, wherever that rule and reign of God is present. And so when people receive Christ, trust in Christ, they receive the rule and reign of Christ, what do they get? They don't cross over into a physical kingdom at that moment. They have a new authority over their life. They have a new power over them. They're set free from an old kingdom, from its old dominion. They live under a new rule and reign. That's why I said at the beginning, sometimes I think our gospel is truncated. Jesus died for your sins. And Jesus came as king and if Jesus is not ruling in your life as king, if he is not your authority, if he is not your sovereign, if you're not free, set free from the old life, if that power is not broken over you in that old life, then Jesus is not king. And if Jesus is not king, Jesus is not savior. These things cannot be separated. Jesus came to rule and to reign. Have we submitted to his rule and reign? But it's also God's realm. Because ultimately, a reign without a realm is meaningless. And I can tell you that I'm, I'm king. I'm king of my domain. It's about as big as my family room. That's about where the, uh, the boundaries of my authority probably exist. Maybe to the boundaries of my yard, at least as far as my dogs are concerned. But ultimately, Jesus will establish not only a spiritual sense, I'm an authority over you and you belong to me, but a physical sense. He will rule in a place, a real kingdom. And that's Future tense, we pray thy kingdom come. We'll talk about this as Jesus teaches prayer. We're making a petition for him to reign, to manifest his kingdom, to demonstrate that sovereign, to rule here as he rules there in heaven. We also find that sometimes this is not a simple concept in Scripture, that the rule and reign of God and the realm of God is both present and not yet. In one sense, he's ruling now. He sits on the throne. In another sense, he will rule, and every knee will bow before him. It's future tense in verses like Mark 9, 47. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into hell. It's the future rule and reign of God. Fully realize where everyone knows and sees Jesus is king. But there's also the present tense rule of reign, rule and reign of Christ. He rules in the life of everyone who is truly his. He rules and reigns in his church, his body, which he is the head. He rules it. He reigns it. And as his people, we should be demonstrating the goodness of his rule everywhere. I mean, this is the heart of our testimony as Christians. Look at my life. 
under the rule and reign of Christ. Look at my life free from the rule and reign of this world and our spiritual enemy, the devil. Look at the freedom that I have in Christ, that I'm new, I've been made new, and I'm not bound to my old sin and my old life anymore. I'm a new creation. And, and look at the rule and reign of Christ among us. That's part of God's testimony to the nations is his church, that we demonstrate what a people look like from every tribe and tongue and nation, every ethnicity and, and every socioeconomic group, people coming together who normally would never be interrelated, who would normally never be brothers and sisters in Christ. Look what God has done in forging and forming a people for himself that gives testimony to the nations. This is what it means for Jesus to be king. But now, thinking sort of logically, I hope, I think it kind of begs the question then, well, isn't God already the great king? We're talking about Jesus coming to the world, he says the kingdom of God is here. Well, what was it before Jesus came? I mean, isn't God already king? There are a number of passages in Scripture that teach this, probably none more frequently than the Psalms. A number of Psalms speak of it. I just chose some. Psalm 10, 16. The Lord is king forever and ever. That's pretty emphatic. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. You heard that read this morning as we started. Verse 8. Who is this king of glory? Who is this one who rules? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Psalm 29, 10. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Psalm 47, 2, the Lord, the most high, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Psalm 95, 3, the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. These are inarguable statements. These are bedrock foundational beliefs that we have as God's people, that our God is king. He hasn't taken his hands off. He's not disconnected from. He's not unaware of. He's not uninvolved in the world that we live in. He's, he's sovereign and king. So how is the reign of Jesus different than this? If God is already king, how is the reign of Jesus different? Well, Jesus introduces a reign of grace into the world. I want you to imagine a strange hypothetical for a moment. Imagine if by God's design, the purpose of Christ was not to mediate God's grace to the world, but the purpose of God in sending Jesus was to only mediate his justice. Purpose of Christ, not to mediate God's grace to the world, but only mediate God's justice. You know what that theoretically could have looked like? You could cut out all the New Testament, you could fast forward simply to the end of Revelation, and you could see Jesus coming in riding on a horse, sword in his hand, being true to the holiness of God, carrying out the purposes of God, and bringing only about righteous and swift and total judgment. And who would have received that judgment? Every body. Every living soul, righteously, rightly crushed by the holy judgment of God, had God's intent been to send Jesus to mediate only his judgment. But he sent Jesus to mediate his grace. You see, Jesus wasn't coming to simply subdue the nations as king, to conquer and overcome them. He was coming to save the nations. He's not only this mediator... He's redeemer. He's a redeeming king. So when Jesus comes, his reign is a saving reign, saving us from death so we can have life, saving us from sin and its shame so that we can have glory and reward, saving us from slavery to sin, but freedom to live as God made us to live with joy and peace. We're saved from our sin. We're saved for following our Savior. Not just saved so that we can go to heaven, saved so that we can enjoy God. Saved from the kingdom of darkness. Saved for the kingdom of light. Jesus came into the world to establish a kingdom of grace. And Jesus is king, not simply because he was declared to be one, but because he came and he fights our enemy 
And he wins. He wins. He fights on the battlefield of temptation. He fights on the battlefield of death itself. He fights and he wins. So why is there a need for this kind of king and this kind of kingdom? I hope the answer is now kind of self-apparent. Because there are two kingdoms. As Chuck Colson said years ago in his book, there are kingdoms in conflict. Jesus spoke of this himself. In Matthew 12, 26, Jesus used this comparison, this analogy. He said, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? You know, people are questioning the miraculous work of Jesus in casting out demons. They said, you know, it's, he's the devil casting out demons. He's deceiving us, which is a huge blasphemy to attribute to God works of Satan. You see, clearly there's a kingdom of Satan then, because Jesus said, how will his kingdom stand? But two verses later, Jesus said, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In my ministry, the kingdom of God has come upon you, Jesus said. So he said, here's this kingdom that exists and has you in its grip. And you may think that you're autonomous. And you may think that you are free To do whatever you want, you may think that you're enjoying that freedom to do whatever you like and pursue any pleasure that you have, but you're in the grip of the enemy and you're in darkness and the end is death and destruction. And so a new kingdom is coming to do battle with this kingdom. It's here. They're in conflict. This is what Jesus came to free us from and ultimately to destroy it forever. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 We hear this staggering statement that John makes, that the Holy Spirit gives him for us. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one? We're not saying that he's sovereign. Only God is sovereign. We're not saying that his influence and dominion is not significant. Now, this is not where hope is found, but it's where reality begins. When you look at the world we're living in, and we see the escalation, the proliferation of evil, this is not something new. What we're seeing now is just that which has long existed in the shadows is now revealing itself with more and more clarity and impunity. Are you watching? Are you looking? Are you paying attention? Are you seeing this rise of evil? What is the answer to it? Not simply that we'll get to go to heaven one day when we die, but the rule and reign of Christ in us and in his church and the declaration of that rule and reign so that people might come out of darkness into light. We know that the Son of God has come, John wrote, after saying that the world lies in the power of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who's true, and we who are in him is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He's the true God and eternal life. It's the great contrast. This world under the dominion of Satan and Jesus who's come, who is true and life, who sets us free. We know in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. John referred to him in, or he's referred to in John 12, 31 as the ruler of this world. John Piper describes his dominion in this statement, which I borrowed. He says, His is a global power that touches and in some measure controls all culture and society. But again, it's not to say that he rules the world completely. God is still sovereign. God in his infinite wisdom has granted Satan the ability to operate under certain parameters with certain limitations. But in this darkness, the majority of the world is in his grasp. People, communities, countries, governments, in his grasp. What is the answer? What's the response? Remember, the Bible says Satan has power over this world, but God has given him dominion over unbelievers only. It's unbelievers who are caught in the snare of the devil, 2 Timothy 2.26. It's unbelievers who lie in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5, 19. It's unbelievers who are in bondage to Satan, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And that's describing you. It doesn't matter if you feel like you are. It doesn't matter if you think that you're not. This is the spiritual reality. There are but two kingdoms. 
two kingdoms alone. We live in what the scripture calls a present evil age. In Ephesians 5, 16, Paul says, redeem the time. Why? Because the days are evil. What are you going to do with the life that you have right now in these evil days? But Paul also says in Galatians 1, 4, that Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. So what happens when you or I are converted? What happens when we repent, when we hear the good news proclaimed, we believe it, we trust in it, we say, I don't want to go that way. I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be enslaved like that. I want to turn to Christ. What happens? Colossians 1, 13. This is what happens. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved, beloved son. He delivers us from that kingdom, places us forever in his kingdom, under his good rule. That's real, that's now, that's present. And one day it will be visible, realized for all people. How does he do this? Well, this is what the scriptures are about. This is the theology of what's happening here in this text, what's happening in the Gospel of Matthew, how we understand how Jesus accomplishes this. I spoke of this one last week, and I'll hit it just briefly. Jesus is presented in the Gospels and also in the writings of Paul, most of the New Testament writings, as a new and better Adam. We were all in Adam. That's our lineage. That's our heritage. That's our nature depicted in Adam. Adam who fell into sin and took mankind with him. Adam whose sin brought about what we call the fall and all of its many effects. But Jesus comes and counteracts the effects of the fall. Whereas Adam was tempted and sinned, Jesus was tempted and did not sin. Jesus lives sinlessly. Whereas Adam brings death, Jesus brings life. Jesus conquers and subdues gods and our enemies. We'll see this clearly unfolding in the Gospel of Matthew through the death and resurrection of Jesus, but also the promises of his return. He conquers death. He battles it. How is Jesus the king of life? Because he fought death, and he won. He lives. He's coming back for us. He conquers and subdues our enemies. And ultimately, the aim of Jesus as the new Adam is to restore the whole created order. What Adam lost, what Adam forfeit, Jesus is going to give back to us. So when you think of what the new heavens and new earth are going to be like, I don't want you to envision yourself sitting on a cloud with a mini harp in your hands with little wings flapping behind you. Nor do I want you to think, as well-meaning as people may be, rest in peace. There will be no rest there. This is the perfect enjoyment and fulfillment of all the goodness of God with God himself at the center of it all forever and ever. That's what God intended. A new Adam has come. Jesus is saying when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand that a new day has dawned. This is the coming of hope. You don't have to live like this anymore. You can escape the rule of the enemy. You can. You can become unbound. You can join a new kingdom. The coming of the king and his kingdom is a present reality. Again, Jesus wasn't just describing pie in the sky one day. He wasn't just describing, hey, this world's going to become more and more hellish. Hang in there because one day you get to go to heaven. He was saying, no, the kingdom is here. We're defeating the enemy right here, right now on his battleground. Where we see the enemy prevailing, we're going to see the enemy defeated. So you see in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus said, if it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. What is he saying? You think Satan has power? Look at this destructive force on this person's life. Look at, the, look at what possession does and how, how destructive and defiling it is. I'll set them free of that. Look at what disease does and its effects on people. I can deliver them from that. Look at what death does and the tears and sorrow it brings to someone like Lazarus. I'm even better and bigger and stronger than that. It's here. It's right now. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Again, thinking future tense. Now the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders thought these promises in the Old Testament of a coming king and a coming kingdom were political. Finally, no more Romans. Finally, no more oppression. Finally, we can be the recognized people of God, the strongest and best on the planet like we once were. 
They didn't realize what a small vision of the kingdom of God that was. They said, when will this happen? Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's not denying a future realm. I'm not saying that. He's saying, don't think this is only future tense. I'm here right now. You can be different right now. You can be free right now. You can experience my power right now. Paul wrote something similar in Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not a future tense celebration. It's not just that. It's the righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Don't you want that? You can have that now. You don't have to wait to that future celebration of eating and drinking. You can know what it means to be right with God and have the joy of Christ in your life right now and have the peace that passes understanding because you're walking faithful with him right now. Because the kingdom of God coming means not only is a new day dawned, but God is forming a new people. A new people are being formed. This is why Jesus came. This is what upset the understanding of those religious nationalists in Israel at the time. This is what was so difficult to understand even for some of the disciples like Peter, who couldn't understand that God's kingdom was not limited to Jewish people, but every tribe and every tongue and every nation, all people in all places, invited into this kingdom. See, God is forming a people who are invited to enter this kingdom, not by crossing over some border, not by coming from Egypt into Israel or any other country into a different country, but by surrendering to the rule of this king. The king is coming and, and let me give you a personal response message. This is sort of a conclusion before the conclusion. The king is coming. You can surrender to him and enjoy his rule. Or you can fight against him and lose. But those are only two choices. You will fight against him and lose and find out you're on the losing side for eternity or you surrender to him because he's the good king. He's a good shepherd. He's a good father who comes to save. He's coming to establish a new people. And this new people is not based on ethnicity. In Matthew 8, verse 11 and 12, he says, I'll tell you, many will come from east and west and will recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What's heaven going to look like? As vast and as varied as the earth itself. Many will come, he said, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. What's the kingdom? Small k? There'll be many of you ethnic Jews who reject, who will be thrown into darkness. Don't think that because you have the ethnicity of Abraham that that will be sufficient to save you. You'll be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You must have the ethnicity of Christ. You must be in Christ. And the offer to enter the kingdom is based on faith. What sort of faith? Simple faith. Childlike faith even. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. I see it. I believe it. And I want it. And I trust in it. And he saves us by his grace. Those who are in the kingdom are identified, however. They bear a mark. So we know those who are his. We know those who are not in that old kingdom anymore, flying that old flag. But those who are under this king's rule, flying his flag, his colors now, those are marked by faithful obedience. This is not the way that we enter into that kingdom. This is the way that we show which kingdom we're in. Listen to what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The flag that I carry that marks me as a member of this new kingdom is faithfulness and obedience because he's my king, because he's your king. In this new kingdom coming, a new way of life will be inaugurated, a new way of living. This is upside down, topsy turvy. Countercultural, different than conventional thinking. A new way of life is coming. Life in this kingdom is the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to slow our pace a little bit as we go through the Gospel of Matthew when we get to chapter 5. 
We're going to take our time and work our way slowly through the greatest sermon ever preached. I tell this story sometimes. If you've heard me say it before, I only say it because it's humorous to me. If it is for you, then enjoy it too. If not, just go with it. First uh, six months or so I was here, I wasn't preaching longer than, than I preach now, but maybe that was a little bit of a different sort of deal than people were used to 12 years ago when I first came, these longer kind of sermons. And someone astutely noted and publicly stated, you know, it only took Jesus nine minutes to give the Sermon on the Mount. Why do you give sermons that last 50 minutes? I don't know what to say to that. I, um, there, it was funny to me, sorry. <laughs> he was a better preacher. What would you like me to say? I don't think everything Jesus said in those sermons is contained in what you see in the Sermon on the Mount. I think the heart of them was retained by the Holy Spirit for our sake. But we're going to take our time working through those. And yes, it'll take us more than nine minutes to do the Sermon on the Mount. It's a new way of life. Consider how the sermon begins. Matthew chapter 5, seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching life in the kingdom. It's a whole new way of life. We'll talk about that. And ultimately, this kingdom is telling us, hang your hat on this, secure your hope here, anchor down deep here, a new future is assured. It's assured. Because the kingdom of heaven is described in Scripture as an inheritance promised by God to his people. This is what I give you because of Christ. This kingdom. We're co-heirs with him. This inheritance in Matthew 25, 34 is this. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Imagine that. God who's never reactive, God who is perpetually proactive, God who's working out his plans in this world has established a kingdom already. He's prepared it for those who are his. And in this excruciatingly powerful passage in Matthew 25 of God's judgment, separation right and left, told that those who are on the right, those who have trusted in Christ, those who have believed the good news, repented and followed him, they inherit something, and it's a kingdom. This kingdom of heaven will be realized in the eternal dominion of Jesus over all people and all things. Eternal dominion. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21 far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He put all things under his feet, and he gave him head over all things to the church. Or 1 Corinthians 15. There's a typo in your notes. If you're looking for 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you're going to read something very, very different. This is 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm going to expand the ring a little bit to verses 24 through 28. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. Remember what I said in the beginning? Right now he's offering you an alternative to that kingdom. He's offering you deliverance from that kingdom. One day he's going to destroy that kingdom forever. There'll be no more enemy of God's people. There'll be no more darkness. There'll be no more death. That kingdom will be destroyed. For he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him and put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. When God, when Christ Jesus has finished his work as redeeming Messiah, conquering our enemy's sin, death, and the grave... And every enemy is destroyed, and the kingdom is secured for all eternity. Here, Father, just what you sent me to do, my work is done. Messiah's work is complete. Revelation 11, 15 gives us a glimpse. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. When Jesus introduces the kingdom, he's introducing himself as the kingdom's redeeming king. A 
come to redeem you, deliver you, and give you a kingdom forever and ever. So what's your response to that? What's your response to that? I know what I was thinking as I put the message together. How do you say no to King Jesus? If we get a vision of, of Jesus big enough that's more than just teacher, miracle worker, crucified, but king? I mean, you realize there's only one choice that you can make here. No other choice makes sense. To put off trusting and following him and stay where and as you are? Why? Why would anyone do that? Why would you do that? Why would you stay still bound in darkness and death, spiritual disorder, internal discord? Why would you stay in that condition? And, and to risk death itself and find out that sin, when it's finished, brings death, but God offered you an alternative to that, an answer to that, deliverance from that with life, to know that you chose death? Why would you do that? He's king. He's a good king. Follow him as king now. Trust him as king now. Enjoy his rule and reign in your life now. And be confident and trust and be secure in the promise that he will rule and reign forever without a doubt. And every eye is going to see. And every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. What's your response to the king today? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and your patience. I thank you for your passionate pursuit of us. Father, I, I, I pray even now that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would overcome our, our ignorance or our indifference, our rebellion, our rejection. Father, we know that there's an enemy that darkens, clouds, blinds, as your word says, the eyes of unbelievers, so we don't see your glory in the face of Jesus. We don't see the gospel, but you bring light. You bring light. Just as one, the one who spoke light into existence and creation, you speak light into our hearts so that we might see your glory in the face of Jesus. And I pray that would happen now. That some might see the glory of the King, Jesus. And repent. Repent of living as my own king. Thinking that one day I would be able to judge myself. That I would sit on a throne one day and evaluate me. That I would have the ability to determine for me heaven. That I get heaven. That I could give that to me. Father, I pray that we would dispel ourselves of any nonsense like that. But instead recognize that you alone are the true king. And while it is your right because you're holy and just and we are sinful we are evil. It's your divine right to judge us for our sin. You sent Jesus, a mediator of mercy and grace, that we could have life instead of death, light instead of darkness, heaven instead of hell. Jesus is king instead of so many poor substitutes. So, Father, I pray that there would be somebody here that would call on King Jesus today. Save me. Save me from this life. Save me from this kingdom. Save me from that end. I want to follow you. I want to know you. I want to trust you. I want you to be my king. I believe you lived perfectly for my sake. That your life is a perfect substitute for my failed one. I believe you died for my sins so that I don't have to face the judgment for them. And I believe that you rose again so that I could have life, not just a better life, but a new life and an eternal life with you. And Father, I pray that just hearing your word today, hearing the gospel and hearing the declaration of the bigness of the kingdom of God in Christ, that, Father, hope would be renewed for those who are discouraged today. Confidence would replace fear for those who are distraught. 
But Father, also that you'd push us to action. We are not to be passive in this kingdom. The command that we're given, the, the commission that we're given is to go to all the world. To, to baptize and to teach. We're to bring about your kingdom. We're, we're to display as a people what it's like to live under the rule and reign of Christ. And we are to aim in every way to see that rule and reign extended. Father, may we see your kingdom grow in this city. May we see your kingdom grow in every mission field where we're involved. May we, may we see your kingdom grow across this nation through so many churches laboring for the sake of the gospel. In nations that are dark, so many churches and believers proclaiming the good news of King Jesus, teaching people to obey and follow him. And Lord, may we pray with diligence, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we are soldiers in your army. Uh, may we no longer be passive. And may we fight the enemy. May we fight for holiness. May we, may we fight for truth. May we know that the enemy distorts, deceives. May we fight for the gospel. May we fight for righteousness and goodness and decency, teaching people to obey Christ in this world. And may we know that all authority is given to us, and you are present with us to the end of the age. So we pray these things for your glory, Father, and we pray these things for the good of those who will know you, who will repent and trust you, who will see you as king and follow you. I pray all this in that king's name.